what is wrong with what medicine is teaching people out there and what the protocols are with the way we view insulin sensitivity. I was doing the exact opposite of what I was being told and I was getting better results. I'm eating six times as much carbohydrate. I'm using 40% less insulin. My energy levels are higher. I'm more hydrated. My glucose is more controllable and my insulin use is down. To all the high quality peer reviewed journals that this information has been available, has been known for almost 100 years, dating back to the 1920s. Ready to live at the higher vibrations, where peace, love, joy, and good health are the daily standard? That's what this show is all about. Welcome to Vibe. And here's your host, Robin Openshaw. Hey everyone, it's Robin Openshaw. Welcome back to the Vibe Show. Today we are talking about diabetes. And whether you've been diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes or not, I think it's a conversation that's useful to everyone because so many people are pre-diabetic and don't know it. And it's habits that they have, it's uh, nutritional choices or habits that lead us to be pre-diabetic. So today I am interviewing Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbero. They are the co-founders of Mastering Diabetes. And it's a coaching program that teaches people how to reverse insulin resistance using a low-fat, plant-based whole food nutrition approach. Uh, Both of them have been living with type 1 diabetes for about 20 years. They're both about 38 to 40. Um, Cyrus has a PhD in nutritional biochemistry and Robbie, who worked at Forks Over Knives, um, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit of what that is if you don't know the documentary and sort of the whole movement of Forks Over Knives, also has a master's degree in public health. So I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation because it really clears the confusion out there about the dietary practices that are usually prescribed to diabetics. So welcome to the Vibe Show, Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbero. Thank you so much for uh, having us here today, Robin. We really appreciate it. I'm excited to talk with a true legend in this space. Haha, <laughs> legend. Um, you guys are diabetics and uh, you also are super educated in your own right. And I'd love for you to take a minute and talk about your journey. Like, I think Cyrus, you're diagnosed type 1 diabetes in 2000. So that's 20 years now. And uh, no, that's you, Robbie. And Cyrus, you're you're a little, what, 18, 19 years. And you're a PhD in nutritional biochemistry from UC Berkeley. That's amazing. Amazing. And Robbie, you have a master's degree in public health. Um, just, you know, one at a time or however you want to do it, tell us about your your journey in diabetes and like mistakes along the way or things that you thought you knew and turned out to be wrong, that kind of thing. Yeah. So just recently, I celebrated my 20th year living with type 1 diabetes. I was diagnosed when I was 12, just about to turn 13, and I actually self-diagnosed myself. I have two older brothers. My middle older brother was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes nine years prior to me. And type 1, that is the type of diabetes where you're not producing sufficient quantities of insulin. And type 2 and prediabetes, you're actually producing excess quantities of insulin. We'll talk about that later. But I got diagnosed with type 1. The doctors, you know, they taught me how to start using insulin to manage my blood glucose levels. And of course, one of the things you learn in the beginning is to limit your carbohydrate content to control your blood glucose levels. That is the standard message for people living with all forms of diabetes. So that was part of my life. I certainly tried doing that. I tried a Weston A. Price Foundation diet, which is basically lots of grass-fed beef. There were to be raw milk in this diet. So I would actually go to a market and buy milk that was for cats because you can't sell raw milk to humans. And I sort of adopted that. Didn't see much change in my diabetes health. Then eventually I also adopted a plant-based ketogenic diet. So I started eating lots of nuts and seeds, lots of oil, lots of, um, you know, sort of like nut butters and avocados and lots of greens as well. And when I did this diet, I, the biggest problem was I didn't have energy. That was my biggest problem. And I was struggling. And so I went back to a naturopath at that time. I was like, Hey, 
what can I do to try and improve this situation? She said, oh, maybe do some chelation therapy. I was like, oh, okay, I'll think about it. But before I did that, I heard a podcast and that podcast changed my life. And actually on that podcast, they were talk- the host was talking about a book that was coming out, which is kind of interesting to be in this situation right now. Like we're on a podcast, we're talking about a book that's coming out. It's really crazy. I hope it changes some lives. But this podcast literally changed my life. The Doug Graham was telling people that you can eat fruits and vegetables, lots of fruits, and this is going to help you cleanse your body, get rid of the things. I'm a naturopath wanted me to try and cleanse those heavy metals and all this stuff that we accumulate over years. And he said, I could do it with this diet of high carbohydrate foods. And I'm like, wait a minute, that sounds crazy. I've been avoiding fruit for all this time and I really want to eat fruit. So let me give this a shot. So I pre-ordered his book and the book comes in the mail. This is December of 2006 now. And Cyrus Kambada, the man, the myth, the legend right here is one of the testimonials in the back of the book. And I'm like, wow, that gives Wait, me- Wait, I was in the back of the book? I should have been in the front of the book. You Come on now. He should have put you on the cover if he wanted to sell more books. Come on now. <laughs> so I'm learning about his story. And I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. It's just more encouraging. I do this online coaching with Dr. Graham. We email each other every single day for 90 days straight. And I learned how to eat a low-fat plant-based whole food diet. And the change that occurred for me was a dramatic adjustment in my insulin sensitivity. The amount of insulin I needed to inject for the amount of carbohydrate I was consuming improved by 600%. And I was using a normal physiological amount of insulin, physiological normal amount that my pancreas would have normally secreted before my beta cells were damaged and were not producing sufficient quantities of insulin. So this was mind altering. And I'm at the University of Florida at this time. I have access to all the high quality peer reviewed journals and I go and start learning that this information has been available, has been known for almost 100 years, dating back to the 1920s. And I got really passionate about this, started educating other people. I worked at Forks Over Knives for six years, helped educate people through that platform. Talk about Forks Over Knives, because not everybody here knows what that is. Okay, so Forks Over Knives is a documentary film. Uh, You can find it on Netflix, and it teaches people the science behind plant-based nutrition and how it addresses the root cause of many of our chronic diseases. That's heart disease, cancer, diabetes. There's testimonials inside the movie of people who've actually reversed those conditions in addition to many others. And there's also books and a website and food products. There's a lot more that the company has expanded into, but start with the movie if you want to learn about Forks Over Knives. Um, It's uh, the number one also food and drink app if you want to get an app in the app store for recipes. So we did a lot of great stuff. It's also one of the top selling magazines in the entire country right now. So now that you've heard Forks Over Knives, it'll be in your consciousness. And when you're checking out at just about any grocery store, any Whole Foods, any Lowe's, any Home Depot, you'll you'll see the, the magazine. So Forks Over Knives is the documentary about the lives and careers of Dr. T. Colin Campbell, of the Oxford Cornell Project. He has been a guest on this show, and it's also about Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who also in his 80s has been a a guest on this show. And I believe Neil Barnard is a guest on your show as well, who's in the movie? Yep. I have so many questions I'm gonna go to later, Robbie, including Simply Raw and Dr. Gabriel Cousins and what he says about the functioning of the pancreas in type one diabetics and Doug Graham and that banana guy on YouTube who ate like 17 bananas and it didn't affect his A1C. So we'll come back to that later. This is going to be fun. Oh, it's going to be really fun. And the guy that I interviewed named Kurt Tyson, a naturopathic doctor from Simply Raw and what he said and how everybody went crazy on me. I'll come back to some of that, but I want to, first of all, I want to hear Cyrus's story. Yeah, no, I'm actually glad that you know a lot about these characters because there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of truth and also a lot of confusion in the the world of, uh, you know, vegan diets, I'll say, um, in for diabetes. And, you know, it can get confusing for sure. So we can definitely dive into a lot of detail. Um, so I, re- you know, my real quick story here is I was diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetes when I was 22. So as a senior in college, I was just graduating uh, from Stanford and I was just trying to move on with my life. 
And um, all of a sudden I get diagnosed not only with, with one autoimmune condition, but with three. So within a six month period, I had developed Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, number one, followed by alopecia universalis, which is why I have no hair, no eyebrows, no eyelashes, nothing. Uh, and then the third one was type one diabetes and all three of these set in within a six month period. And so you can imagine going from just being, you know, a happy go lucky college kid to all of a sudden, you know, a chronic disease patient with three autoimmune conditions with no explanation. What attacked your immune system? I mean, holy cow. Yeah, no idea. I, I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't know if I ever will know the answer to that question. Uh, it could have been something, you know, uh, some combination of nutrients in the food that I was eating, some kind of contaminants. It could have been a virus that I contracted because there's a pretty strong, uh, you know, body of evidence that shows that certain viruses can trigger autoimmunity as well. And, um, it could have been some combination of all of that together. The point being is I went from being, you know, happy go lucky kid to all of a sudden having three autoimmune conditions, one of which was life threatening being type one diabetes. And the doctors at that told, at that time told me to just eat a low carbohydrate diet because like Robbie said, you know, it, the, the prevailing wisdom in the world of diabetes back then, and now even 20 years later is that a low carbohydrate diet is the only way to control your blood glucose. And so that's what I was told, you know, eat less carbohydrate because that's going to metabolize to less blood glucose. And if you do that, then you can control your blood glucose with precision and you can keep your insulin use low. So I said, cool, let's do it. So I started eating uh, a lot of animal based foods that were low in carbohydrates, such as meat, cheese, chicken, fish. I would have some olive oil, peanut butter, avocados, and, you know, I was, I was eating some carbohydrate rich food like rice and pasta and some fruits and potatoes, but I was trying to keep it pretty low. So I was eating maybe like a hundred grams of carbohydrate per day, but that was pretty much it. So this was supposed to make my blood glucose more controllable. It didn't, not even close. In fact, my blood glucose was a freaking disaster. On any given day, you'd look at my blood glucose meter and um, it was just a roller coaster up, down, up, down, up, down. And uh, as a result of that, it just like, took a lot of emotional energy out of me. It took a lot of physical energy out of me. And I started to get really depressed. Like, like this thing was just going to take over my life and that I, I couldn't solve it. So about a year into this process, I decided, yeah, I was just going to, I had to change something because current, my, my current lifestyle just was not working. So I uh, looked for information online and I ran across this guy named Doug Graham. And Doug Graham said, you know, I picked up the phone, I called him and I said, hey, can you can you handle this basket case? And he said, yeah, for sure. Come over to this uh, health and fitness retreat that I'm running and uh, let's do some really cool work together. So I got there and over a seven day period, you know, Robbie did a, a coaching program with him on the phone or via email. And I did an in-person um, retreat with him for seven days. And there he basically showed me how to throw away all of these like animal-based foods that I was eating. No more meat, no more chicken, no more fish, no more dairy, none of that stuff. And instead, in substitute, I just ate literally a ton of fruit and a ton of vegetables. That was it. I didn't even have beans, lentils, peas. I had no whole grains. It was just a very simple, it was a raw food diet. And I, and I didn't know that much. And I was like, okay, great, let's just do it. You know, I have nothing to lose. So under his supervision in the first week, my carbohydrate intake went from about 100 grams per day to 600 grams of carbohydrate per day. So I six folded my carbohydrate intake and guess what happened to my insulin use? Tell us. It went down by 40%. Okay, so I was doing the exact opposite of, of what I was being told and I was getting better results. So I'm eating six times as much carbohydrate, I'm using 40% less insulin, and my energy levels are higher, I'm more hydrated, my glucose is more controllable, and my insulin use is down. And I was like, what? This is, this is unbelievable. So I, I, you know, long story short, I went back to school and I got a PhD in nutritional biochemistry so that I could learn the science here and not just have an N of one anecdotal story, but actually see if this approach to adopting a plant-based diet could actually be applicable to other people. So while I was at school at UC Berkeley for five years, I studied insulin resistance, what causes it, how to reverse it, how does intermittent fasting affect it, how does exercise affect it, how does food affect it. And in this process, I uncovered this, you know, collection of research that's been published for a hundred years about what the scientific community has uncovered in really creating and reversing diabetes. And once I learned that, I was like, oh my God, why is it that the scientific community has a ton of information, but yet what the public does is literally the exact opposite. 
And so that's when Robbie and I ended up joining forces because we met somewhere along the way, decided that we were both like, you know, basically the exact same person. He just, <laughs> you know, he developed type, type one diabetes two years before me. And, and in this process, we said, hey, wait a minute, let's try and teach people living with all forms of diabetes, how they can manipulate their diet to their advantage so that they can also tremendously increase their insulin sensitivity, get rid of insulin resistance and actually have the best glucose control they've ever had in their life. That's where we are today. You both have amazing stories and you're both very brave to go out there because I would imagine that you take, if, if you went out there among the diabetic population, you would take a lot of slings and arrows and there'd be a lot of incredulity. Um, you probably get questioned a lot. I mean, you, the results speak for themselves. Everybody isn't seeing you guys like I am, but you guys, they are fit. They're, they both have like gorgeous skin. Uh, Robbie's a you know, competitive tennis player. He just threw it down and said we should play tennis. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'm sure he'll crush me with his serve. Most guys do. Um, mm -hmm. but they, um, you know, they're impressive, uh, what they've accomplished. And so I don't, I don't know which one of you wants to take this question, but there's, it's a sea change. Like you're not suggesting something that's a little bit different than what's out there. You have millions of diabetics who believe they have to avoid bananas at all cost. What is wrong with what medicine is teaching people out there and what the protocols are, what is wrong out there with the way we view insulin sensitivity? Okay, so um, this is a great question. And I think this is like, this could be, you know, a five hour long response, but I'll try and keep it relatively short. Um, first off, uh, doctors are wonderful people, super altruistic. They go into medicine because they actually want to help people. Um, when they're in medical school, they get, you know, 10,000 plus hours of medical school education and, and clinical experience and they learn nutrition for something like 20 hours. So, you know, it's not their fault, but they are taught how to use pharmaceutical medication and they're not taught how to use food as medicine. So as a result of that, uh, your average doctor just doesn't really, never, never was given the training to talk about food. Um, so as a result of that, this traditional low carbohydrate philosophy that has existed since the 1960s, 1950s, maybe even before that, um, it just continues. And it continues to um, be the standard of the status quo and the, um, the standard of treatment for people living with all forms of diabetes. And the problem is that when you adopt a low carbohydrate diet, you will likely get good results. And what I mean by that is that whether you're eating an Atkins diet or a paleo diet or a ketogenic diet, any one of these low carbohydrate diets um, can be, if, if implemented properly, will lead to a number of positive benefits. Number one, weight loss, rapid weight loss. And that happens usually risk, you know, within the first couple of days, if not weeks of adopting one of these low carbohydrate diets. Number two, reduced total cholesterol. Number three, increased HDL cholesterol. Number four, reduced A1C value, which is a marker of your blood glucose control. Number five, reduced fasting blood glucose. Number six, reduced fasting insulin. So imagine starting a low carbohydrate diet, seeing all these positive results, and then coming back to your doctor three to six months later, your doctor does another blood test. They take a look and they go, oh my God, you lost 37 pounds. Your A1C is now approaching the non-diabetic range. Your fasting insulin is down. Uh, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. This is clearly working, right? And, and that's, I think, one of the, like, amen, you know, like, power to the people who are putting in the effort to change their diet. I think it's great. The problem, though, is that when you adopt a low-carbohydrate diet, you get a lot of, like, short-term positive benefits that we're talking about here. But in the long term, um, it end, these low-carbohydrate diets end up causing a lot of problems. Um, there's plenty of evidence that we know in the scientific literature to show that low carbohydrate diets, especially if they contain uh, significant amounts of animal products, um, are, can increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, for atherosclerosis, and for insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is really the name of the game in this, in this whole paradigm here for talking about diabetes. Because yes, a low carbohydrate diet will flatline your blood glucose and will get you, uh, uh, it'll, it'll make it look like your blood glucose control is better. However, the minute you try and consume anything that's carbohydrate rich, whether it's even a single banana, a mango, 
a bowl of quinoa, some wild rice, a potato, a bowl of beans, anything that's carbohydrate rich, your glucose is likely to go very high and it's likely to stay high. And the reason for that is because there's an underlying biology which is not being addressed. There's an underlying biology that's happening inside of your muscle and liver, which is actually getting worse over the course of time when you eat a low carbohydrate diet. The reason you don't see it on a low carbohydrate diet is because you literally don't eat anything that's carbohydrate rich. So effectively, it appears as though your diabetes health is improving, but in reality, your diabetes health is actually either not improving or getting worse because you're literally just avoiding the carbohydrate challenge, which is as soon as you do integrate that carbohydrate challenge, your blood glucose goes high, your insulin levels go high, and all of a sudden now diabetes becomes visible. Is this making sense? It makes sense. And I have been talking about these issues for many years, and you just explained it with fewer words and more clearly than I've ever heard anybody do it. I think I'm going to end up referring a lot of people to this episode because they always start talking about some short term, you know, lab result, some biomarker that in the course of a couple of weeks changed and seems like something favorable. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? When you stop eating fiber and when all the most nutritious foods, very well documented to prevent human disease, are eliminated because they're all they're all the nu- nutrient dense ones. Your liver can't do it. Like your liver can't actually handle the amount of fat that's in this latest fad, the ketogenic mm-hmm. diet, which might be the most destructive diet I've seen in 25 mm-hmm. years of following diet fads, except that actually mm-hmm. it just got trumped by the by the carnivore diet. So I love the way that you explained it because it's really perfect for a lay person to understand, which is that the problem with diabetes is there are all these complexities and it's really hard to ex- explain to someone who hasn't been studying, who doesn't have a PhD in nutritional biochemistry like you do, um, that these short-term gains, I mean, I don't know. I feel like at least in North America, we're so wired for the short-term gain for the, you know, we just get some kind of dopamine hit about seeing, you know, like triglycerides come down. But then you've really explained uh, what the long-term effect is. I just talk all the time about the liver and how backed up the liver gets if it doesn't get enough high fiber, nutrient dense, sorry, carbohydrate foods. Do you guys feel like, do you feel like we're obsessing about the wrong things? Like everybody's obsessed with counting grams of proteins, fats, and carbs. And there's another story that should be told. Yes. And I'm actually really glad that you brought this up actually, because, um, you know, a lot of the times I, I just personally, I get sick of talking about carbohydrates. I really do. And, and if you think about it, you, you, when you open your mouth to eat a plate of food, you're not eating carbohydrate and fat and protein. I mean, you are, but you're actually eating food, right? You're eating bananas, you're eating mangoes, you're eating papayas, you're eating, um, you know, you're, you're drinking a green smoothie. So rather than talking about the components of those foods, which is what has become our vernacular, it's more important to talk about the food as a whole, because when you talk about the food as the whole, you, you have the ability to talk about all of the nutrients that are contained within that food. We as human beings try to simplify things as much as possible because it allows us to be able to you know, create, you know, understand a complicated puzzle better. The truth is that when you're eating, let's, let's take a food example, like let's take a potato, right? A potato contains carbohydrate and fat and protein. And most people think of a potato as just being like this giant carbohydrate bomb and having zero fat and zero protein, which is not biologically accurate. So potato contains carbohydrate and fat and protein. In addition to that, it also contains vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. Okay. These are all just like classes of micronutrients, which are important to talk about in addition to the macronutrients because a potato is actually a three-dimensional complex object. And that object has both macronutrients and micronutrients in it. And you can think of like the structure of that potato being made up of predominantly fiber. It gives it its three-dimensional shape. But then interspersed inside of this, these fiber molecules, like interspersed inside of this like fiber rebar, if you will, you have other, you have, you have protein, you have fatty acids, you got vitamins, minerals, fiber, water, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. And so it's this very complex three-dimensional structure. 
such that when you put that inside of your mouth and that food gets chomped by your teeth and then travels down your esophagus into your stomach and then into your small intestine, the enzymes that are, that are injected into your small intestine that are either made by the walls of your small intestine or that are made by other tissues like your pancreas or your liver, those enzymes have a job. Each one of them has a very specific job. And whether the job is to extract and break down the fatty acids or extract and break down the carbohydrate chains or extract and break down the protein or extract and break down the vitamin B12 or uh, you know, any of the other components, the micronutrients, um, each one of those enzymes has a very specific function and it takes time for those enzymes to act on a, a very complex biology. And because it takes time, it, it actually leads to a, a very physiological normal um, appearance of glucose in your blood, an appearance of amino acids in your blood, an appearance of fatty acids in your blood. And, and the nice thing is that there's, there's a combination of nutrients that actually acts like a soup. And this soup allows these nutrients to show up in your blood at a totally normal, physiologically uh, relevant rate. If you instead were to eat, or let's say you drank a Coca-Cola, or let's say you had potato chips as an example, you know, refined products that contain sweeteners inside of them, or refined products that have you know, oils and um, you know, they've been stripped of their total macronutrient or the, their total nutrient value. When you eat those foods, um, they're missing fiber, they're missing vitamins, minerals, fiber, um, water, antioxidants. And as a result of that, the speed at which your digestive system can act on it is much faster, much faster. And, and by doing so, glucose shows up in your blood quicker, fatty acids show up in your blood quicker, amino acids show up in your blood quicker. And then that leads to unfavorable responses that can then cause tissue level inflammation. It can assault your liver, it can assault your pancreas, it can assault your brain. And as a result of that, now you have tissue level inflammation, which is happening all throughout your body. And a lot of that inflammation is just literally related to the speed at which those nutrients had access to your blood. So long-winded way of me saying, eating whole foods is a simple, 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 simple thing that you can do to make sure that the speed at which nutrients get into your blood is actually slowed down. And when that happens, you can actually uh, incorporate those nutrients and transport those nutrients in a very physiological, normal manner. And by doing so, your long-term health is greatly increased. Yeah, good explanation. I told you guys before we got started that I had just interviewed Neil Barnard uh, today, and it was like a boom, 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 very quick. But he talked about how being vegan or getting, you know, the, all that tells you is that you don't eat animal products. He said that's a starting point. Then from there, you have lots more discovery to do. And I'm wondering, you guys don't eat animal products. Uh, you can certainly, as, as you both respond to this, tell me if, no, there are some animal products that I now have in my diet or I found that this works for me and that work doesn't work for me. I'd love to know, um, really, because I know my audience wants to know this. They always want to get into that. What do you eat? I want to know what you eat and 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 how, you know, how many units of insulin are you dependent on? How often do you actually have to use insulin or are you completely off of insulin? Because it's, it's people are shocked when I, I did a YouTube video, I want to say 10 years ago with Kurt Tyson, who was in Dr. Gabriel Cousins. Uh, experiment, Simply Raw, which is another documentary. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it and feel free to talk about that. But he put 30 um, diabetics, I think they were all type one on an all raw vegan diet and some of them dropped out. But there were a bunch of diabetics and Kurt Tyson was one of them who got off of insulin. And he told me on this video and I got just screamed at. So many people were coming at me and saying, you can't get off insulin and you can't cure type one diabetes. And I was like, hey, hey, hold on didn't say he cured it. What he said is, I don't have to use insulin. He's living with it. Like you guys said, I'm, he's managing it. He's living with it. And he and he said, if I eat anything junky, if I have a backslide in the way that I know I should eat, then I might end up, or if I get sick, then I might end up using insulin. But he was a type one diabetes who uh, for weeks and weeks or months and months on end doesn't have to use any insulin. So I'd like to know, like, what do you guys eat? And when is it that you de then do have to uh, use some insulin or other meds? 
Okay, this is a, a great question and one of the very few podcasts where we can dig deep into some nuances here. And I'm happy to talk about that, the Kurt Tyson um, story. So you're right, I saw that movie Simply Raw. I believe it was five, five or six people who came to the Tree of Life Center and they made a movie about what happened. And at the time of filming, they did not, Kurt Tyson had not gotten blood work. So as far as they knew while he was there, they thought he was a, a type two, that's what they thought. And so this whole journey of, of trying to reverse type one diabetes, to try and get beta cells to work is something I'm very passionate about, something I've dug very deep into. And so I have to get some more data on Kurt's current situation, which would be interesting, but my intuition is that what's happening for Kurt is he's living with what would be called type 1.5 diabetes. He probably has some antibodies present. He probably has a lower C peptide. And C peptide is a measure of basically how much insulin your body is producing. So he probably has a lower number, but he's producing enough of his own insulin in order to manage his blood glucose if he eats food in a certain way. That's what I believe is happening there. And we actually see clients like that as well in the Mastering Diabetes Coaching Program. But for what happens to me and Cyrus personally is we have zero insulin production. I have a C-peptide test, which is less than 0.1, meaning that I have no insulin inside my body helping to metabolize the food that I'm eating. Okay, because I remember um, Dr. Cousins saying that he believes the evidence shows that of type one diabetics, there's about 83, 84% of them who do still have some functioning in the islets of Langerhans. And so if, if he's right about that, you guys are both in that category of that's never going to come back and you're always going to have to use insulin, right? Yeah. So I, mean, I definitely would love to look more into that data and understand what, what he's coming from there and, and how much insulin he's um, suggesting that type ones are producing. But um, yeah, correct, in general, there's a certain number of people living with type one diabetes who are genuinely producing close to zero insulin. There's nothing helping. So therefore, when we eat food, our goal is to inject the same amount of insulin our pancreas would have normally secreted before the beta cells were damaged. That's our goal. So there's published research on people following low carbohydrate diets, following a ketogenic diet, true type ones without insulin production, they'll eat 30 grams of carbohydrate per day and they'll inject about 30 total units of insulin per day. So for a 24 hour carbohydrate to insulin ratio, that's one to one. Whereas right now, I'll speak for myself and I'll let Cyrus share his numbers. I eat over 700 grams of carbohydrate per day and I inject a total of about 27 units of insulin. So there's a dramatic increase in total carbohydrate while I'm still using the same amount of insulin, which is an indication of a huge improvement in insulin sensitivity. So on a typical day for breakfast, I mean, I'll tell you what I'm eating today. For breakfast, I had papaya today, I had some mangoes, and I had some arugula for breakfast. That was my breakfast. Um, for lunch today, actually, I'm gonna pull up my little app here and I'll tell you. But it's basically fruits and greens and lots of and non-starchy vegetables. Lunch today is another fruit salad, it has papaya, mangoes, kale, lettuce, arugula, and bananas. I eat an afternoon snack that has wild blueberries, mangoes, tomatoes, and spinach. For dinner, it's gonna be mangoes, mandarin oranges, lettuce, kale, tomatoes, and kiwi. But in general, it's a diet of in-season fruits in, in large quantities because they're full of water, they're full of fiber. I have lots of greens, that's arugula, that's kale, that's spinach, that's Swiss chard, lots of non-starchy vegetables like carrots, tomatoes, zucchini, cucumber, lots of herbs and spices. So things like cilantro, basil, spices, you know, like, you know, pepper and all that stuff. Um, and nuts and seeds occasionally. I'll have some Brazil nuts, I'll have some almonds, I'll have a little bit of avocado. And that's pretty much my diet. Very simple, all whole foods, and it really keeps me feeling energetic, keeps me insulin sensitive. And it's also, you know, cleared up my skin, which was terrible. I had cystic acne. I had plantar fasciitis that went away. I had warts on my feet. I had seasonal allergies. I used Nasonex, I used Claritin D, would still get sick. 
I don't take any other medication other than insulin. So interesting you say you have cystic acne because the first thing I noticed about you is that man has gorgeous skin. <laughs> you both do. You both do. And I, and I think that it goes to, um, you know, it goes to what your skin looks like when you eat a really clean plant-based diet. Like I, where was I? I think I was out on my, maybe my personal page where I told the story of my boyfriend who's the age of you guys. He's 39 and I've put him on my detox three times and he does it willingly and he's getting more and more and more willing about it because of what happens when he eats nothing but plants for like he's done it for up to three weeks at a time. And this is a guy who never went one single day of his life without eating not just animal products, but like meat, like two, three times a day. And um, I had told him, your poop doesn't stink if you eat all plants. And people don't believe me. He didn't. I don't think he believed me about that. And I was like, yeah, you got to give it a week or two, clear all the other stuff out. But like, you know, if you walk past a horse poop in the road, and maybe a lot of people in, you know, really urban areas have never walked past a horse turd. And that's like totally normal here in Utah. But like, what does it smell like? It smells like alfalfa. And that's, that's mm -hmm. like, I don't think most Americans realize that this horrible foul smell from bathrooms is like not actually normal. So yeah. what so what all what are all the things that you noticed, Robbie, when you got onto a plant-based diet? And PS, all those foods you're talking about, that sounds like really low calorie and I know that there's going to be people listening going, "Wait, that's like not enough calories." Yeah, so I eat large quantities of them. Large quantities. <laughs> okay. And and that's the fun part. I mean, on this program, you get to eat more and way less because of the calorie density, because the foods are loaded with water and loaded with fiber. By mass, a mango is, I believe a mango is almost 90% water. Watermelon is 95% water. Lettuce is 95% water. Banana is like 75% water. So it's really eating this way, eating these whole foods, even you know, potatoes, quinoa, rice, all these foods. We have a whole chart in our book, um, are high in water content, meaning that is the most pure form of water you can get. That's the first source of high quality water is whole foods where the water has been filtered by nature. Mm, okay. And, and do you feel like you need to chew it or when, when you blend it, is that going to spike your insulin? So I do prefer to chew my meals and enjoy them, um, you know, slowly and, and not like inhale my meals. That's really helpful. I do wear a continuous glucose monitor so I can see how my meals impact my blood glucose level. Every five minutes, I get a new reading on my phone telling, telling me exactly where I'm at. So I've noticed that if I'm going to drink a smoothie, which I love to do, my favorite smoothie, I'll put um, bananas and some frozen bananas and some carob powder and um, maybe a little bit of arugula in there. And that is my favorite smoothie. I will just drink it slowly. I'll drink it slowly and I also might pour it on top of a bed of greens and sort of make almost like a salad to a certain extent. And that also helps keep the absorption of the glucose at a steady rate. Okay. Awesome. Cyrus, what do you eat? So I used to be a raw foodie myself for the first 14 years because that's what Doug Graham had taught me to do. And I got phenomenal results doing it. But over the course of time, I started to integrate some more cooked foods, you know, 100% plant based cooked foods into my diet. And I started to love it. So first things first in the morning, I'll usually wake up and I will eat half of one of those large Mexican Maridol papayas. And um, I'll also eat maybe two bananas to go along with that. Then I will go and exercise. And when I come back home from exercise, my wife is um, a doll and she makes me a giant smoothie bowl every day. And I absolutely love it. So the smoothie bowl usually has something like, you know, maybe one and a half or two plantains in it. And then I will, she'll cut up some papaya and put it on top. Maybe she'll cut up a mango and put that on top. And then she will, um, you know, the, the whole collection usually contains something like 250 grams of carbohydrate right there in that one sitting. So it's, it's very fruit heavy for breakfast. It's fruit heavy for lunch. Then the afternoon rolls around. And at that point, I'll usually jump into some garbanzo beans. Maybe I'll have a little bit of pineapple to go along with that. And then by the time dinner rolls around, it's usually some kind of large vegetable centric dish that's got maybe some more garbanzo beans plus zucchini noodles, uh, some steamed vegetables, maybe some steamed cauliflower or steamed uh, broccoli. And then I'll usually have like tomatoes and onions and um, maybe some green papaya um and some cucumbers so it's like kind of non-starchy vegetables or steamed vegetables plus um some legumes here and there and uh you know as far as 
carbohydrate value is concerned, it's up there with Robbie, you know, 600, 700, 800 grams of carbohydrate per day. Uh, as far as fiber intake concern is concerned, it's usually upwards of like 60, 65, 70, 80 grams per day. And as far as total calories are concerned, it's usually somewhere upwards of 2,600 at the minimum, sometimes upwards of 3,400, depending on how much I exercise that day. Um, and um, it's pretty tasty. I'm not going to lie. Okay. So you're eating legumes. I don't hear Robbie talking about eating legumes and you only eat a little bit of nuts and seeds. Um, how come no legumes that I, did I hear in that list, Robbie? Any, anything wrong with that for diabetics? There's nothing wrong with beans. I mean, as a matter of fact, if you look at the, the blue zones, the longest lived people on the planet, the most consistent thing they eat is beans. So we are big advocates of beans. We encourage beans. I personally, I just don't like them. So uh, I've been eating this way for 13 years. Um, I'm happy with it and I'm just going to keep enjoying my food. Yeah. Cause I've always felt like if you're going to be vegan, I don't know how you would be vegan without, um, a lot of legumes and maybe some whole grains. And I was like, wow, you're not talking about any of those. So you must eat a lot of quantity because, uh, just, you're just mostly talking about greens and, and fruits and a little bit of vegetables. Super interesting. There's a lot of play there. You guys have a pretty different diet. Yeah. Well, I mean, the beauty here is that, you know, what we encourage people to do, you know, but beyond what Robbie does and beyond what I do is what the research shows is that eating a whole food plant-based diet that is low in fat is one of the most successful, one of the most tremendously powerful ways that you can reverse insulin resistance in your body. Okay. So we refer to it as a low fat plant-based whole food diet. And um, regardless of, you I mean, you can do that in a thousand different ways. You can do it in a completely raw manner like Robbie does it. You can do it in like a raw plus some not raw way that I do it. You can do it in like a predominantly cooked food way as well. You can be eating lots of quinoa and brown rice and whole grains and legumes with small amounts of fruit as well. And really the world is your oyster. Um, it really just depends on whether you like eating savory foods or sweet foods, whether you like having cooked foods or not cooked foods, whether you like having things warmer or at room temperature, whatever you want to do is totally up to you. And the beauty is that regardless of the approach that you take, uh, you can dramatically improve your insulin sensitivity and it doesn't really take that long of a period of time at all. Okay. And I, and I know that you guys feel really strongly that like I do, that this latest fad, the ketogenic diet has been frustrating. You probably field questions about it almost every day. And the frustrating thing to me is that people are like, I went on the ketogenic diet and I lost 30 pounds. And so the, you know, what they're saying is, therefore it's a good diet. And it's kind of like what Cyrus was talking about before. Yeah. You can lose 30 pounds eating almost any diet because it eliminates most of the foods that most people eat. But, um, talk a little bit about the keto diet. And if people are like, well, can I at least eat a plant-based ketogenic diet? What do you guys think about that? Cause there are a few of my colleagues who are now who, who were vegans and they're, they're kind of on the high fat train. What do you think about the plant-based keto diet too? Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you brought this up actually, cause the plant-based ketogenic diet is becoming super popular these days. And you know, it's got some pros and some cons just like <laughs> practically any other diet out there. Um, okay. When it comes to a plant-based ketogenic diet, if you choose to eat that way, what that means is that you're basically still drastically limiting your car, your total carbohydrate intake to something like what, what people refer to as called 30 net 30 net refers to approximately 30 grams of net carbohydrate, which means that you have taken the, you're not accounting for fiber. Okay. You're eliminating the fiber out of that equation. So, you know, it basically just boils down to eating a very small total amount of carbohydrate on a daily basis from things like fruits and legumes and whole grains and starchy vegetables like potatoes. Um, the majority of your calories will be coming from uh, nuts and seeds and avocados and coconuts and uh, olive oil or MCT oil um, or coconut oil. Okay. And that's the sort of like bulk of your calories. Now, when you do a plant-based, if, if, you, if you are determined to eat a ketogenic diet or a very low carbohydrate diet, then yes, please make it plant-based. There's advantages to doing this. Number one, you're going to significantly increase your total fiber content. And that is a big, big, big deal. Versus the regular ketogenic diet where you might be eating burgers and cheese and stuff. Is that what you're saying? Exactly right. Yeah. A regular ketogenic diet um, you know, has a relatively low fiber content. You know, you could be eating 
15 grams of fiber per day, 20 grams of fiber per day, you know, 30 grams of fiber today. And that, and that is insufficient. No questions asked. When you eat a plant-based ketogenic diet, you can easily eat 50, 60, 70, 80 grams of carbo, uh, of fiber in your diet, especially if your non-starchy vegetable intake is high. And when I say non-starchy vegetables, I'm talking about things like cucumbers and celery and zucchini and cauliflower and uh, broccoli and uh, tomatoes. You know, you eat a lot of these foods and you're going to increase your carbo, I'm sorry, your fiber intake, no question. Okay, so number one, your fiber intake is going to increase this. That's a great thing. Uh, number two, you're also going to eliminate a lot of these sort of problematic saturated fatty acids that tend to come with uh, animal-based foods. So when you're eating cheese and meat and fish um, and eggs, you're, you're drastically increasing your total intake of saturated fatty acids. And saturated fatty acids are the, the number one uh, nutrient that is most strongly correlated with the development of insulin resistance. So if you, if you are decreasing your saturated fatty acid intake, you're going to decrease your risk for the development of insulin resistance. You're going to decrease your LDL cholesterol. And that is going to have profound implications for uh, the, your risk for heart disease in the future. Um, the, the problem with, these, uh, with a ketogenic diet that is plant-based is that, number one, it's still going to increase your level of insulin resistance. It will. Okay, it's just that it's not going to be as dramatic as it would be if you were eating an animal-based ketogenic diet, and it's certainly going to your your level of insulin resistance is going to be dramatically higher than it would be if you were eating the way Robbie and I described. If you eat a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, and then number two, there's actually insufficient long-term research about the effects of a plant-based ketogenic diet. We, you know, in, as a whole, we don't have very good data about long-term outcomes on a ketogenic diet, period, end of story. That's because nobody's ever done it long-term. We Exactly. I mean, th there's actually a paper that was just published um, not too long ago in June of last year that documented the effects of a two-year intervention eating a ketogenic diet that did contain animal products. And uh, the results were very, very mediocre. And um, I was not impressed by the data in any way, shape, or form. Um, and so, you know, two years is sort of like the, the upper end of, you know, good randomized control data that we really do have. And that's concerning because just like Robbie was talking about, you know, in the blue zones, you have a whole collection of research that actually documents how people have been eating for, you know, the longest lived people have been eating. And I can tell you right off the bat, one of the things you'll find out is that they're predominantly eating a, you know, mainly plant-based diet that happens to be you know, very low in total fat. And that's a very good thing, high in fiber, to low in total fat. Um, and then there's also, you know, a whole bunch of research that's actually been done in people living with uh, all forms of diabetes, mainly people with type 2 diabetes, that document the effects of a plant-based diet on um, their, you know, their improvement in A1C and improvement in or decrease in body weight. And you just see consistently over and over and over and over and over again, when you eat a plant-based diet, especially if the plant-based diet is low in total fat, you get the most dramatic short-term improvements that also translate to improved long-term health. And I think that's what the ketogenic world is missing. The short-term improvements are important. Don't get me wrong. But the long-term improvements usually don't happen. And the long-term improvements actually go in the opposite direction and you actually increase your risk for chronic disease. And in my mind, that is not worth it. It is not worth it. Not even close. Very well said. So mainstream nutrition says that fruit's high in sugar, and when you eat fruit, it will cause a blood sugar spike. I know that you guys have proven with your own personal experiment for 20 years that this is not true for you. Do you feel confident going out there and saying that's true for everyone, or is it individual? Talk a little bit about that. Why is it that for you, too, at least... You eat lots of fruit. The, the diet you two just described as what you eat in a day, you eat a lot more fruit than I do. And I'm not afraid of fruit. And I talk all the time about how nobody ever got diabetes, type 2 diabetes from eating too much fruit. It's never happened. That's not what is causing the meteoric rise in diabetes. So what do you have to say about that? So this is one of the most frustrating and also motivating topics that comes up just about every day. And now 
it's really gaining momentum more so with, I mean, obviously the popularity of Instagram, but also the access to continuous glucose monitors and, you know, regular people being able to, and educators and doctors being able to be like, oh, look, I'm going to do this personal experiment in my own body and I'm going to eat, you know, a bunch of sugar, a bunch of, you know, processed food or I'm even going to try it with orange juice, which people say is healthy, or I'm going to try it with bananas. And I'll show you on my CGM how my, my blood glucose spikes. And I'll even do some blood work and show you my insulin levels spike. And the biggest problem, the biggest mistake that's being made repeatedly is that people try and implement, try and eat higher carbohydrate foods, whether they're whole or processed, while still consuming a high fat diet they're still consuming 20% of calories from fat, 30% of calories from fat, 40% of calories from fat. They're adding in some carbohydrate rich food. And yes, they're seeing a spike. They're seeing higher insulin levels, but that's not the root of the problem. The problem is that they are consuming high fat ingredients, which have led to insulin resistance, meaning their body cannot process and metabolize the glucose that's coming in from whatever source they're eating it. And when you actually go and look at the peer reviewed research, you will find repeatedly that even when subjects are fed processed carbohydrates, I'm talking about liquid sugar diets in a low fat environment, you still see a reduction in blood glucose levels and insulin levels. So for example, in 1971, Dr. Brunzel published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, and he gave the subjects a liquid solution diet, which contained 85% carbohydrate coming from dextrose, basically straight sugar, and 15% of calories coming from protein, which was in a protein powder form, 0% fat. He compared this to a control diet of 30% of calories coming from fat. And what he saw was that when those subjects were given an oral glucose tolerance test, which is a glucose challenge, it's 75 grams of glucose, consumed, and then you have your blood glucose measured every 30 minutes for two to three hours. He saw that at every point during that oral glucose tolerance test, their blood glucose levels were lower on the sugar water diet, and their insulin levels were lower on the sugar water diet. And this type of research has been performed repeatedly, whether it's Walter Kempter in the 50s, whether it's Hemsworth in the 30s, whether it's Sansom in the 20s. When people eat carbohydrate-rich food, in a low fat environment, you can expect lower fasting blood glucose levels, lower blood glucose levels throughout the day, and a reduction in insulin levels because insulin sensitivity is improved. Does that make sense, Robin? It makes sense. And just to boil it down for everyone, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm really boiling it down here, is that for some reason, for decades now, we are still, our medical doctors, our most uh, educated people among us are still hung up on the sugars. And you're saying, you're not saying drink sugar water. You're not saying refined sugar is just fine. You're saying even with that, it's about the fat. It's exactly right. It's exactly right. I'm saying that there is no evidence. I, I'm saying, I mean, this is it's a hard thing to say when it comes to science, but like, oh, there's zero evidence. But I have yet to find anybody showing one published paper to the contrary that when people eat a low fat diet and consume carbohydrate rich food in whatever form, see anything other than improved insulin sensitivity. Whereas what you're hearing is the public saying the exact opposite. They're saying sugar causes insulin resistance. They're saying these processed sugar frees, they cause diabetes. It is absolutely not true based on the research. Okay, so in other words, here's what I think about it. In a high fat environment, then eating carbohydrate rich anything will make your blood glucose go high. In a low fat environment, eating carbohydrate rich food becomes very easy to do and easily metabolizable. So the problem in the diabetes world is that most people are operating in a high fat environment at baseline. And especially if you're eating a ketogenic diet, then you're eating, then you're operating in a very high fat environment. In that setting, consuming carbohydrate rich anything just doesn't work. And so that's what people get frustrated is they're like, oh, look, I ate a banana, I ate a potato and my blood glucose spiked. And where the answer is, it's not the banana's fault. It's not the potato's fault. Go backwards in time and try and figure out all the stuff that you ate 
leading up to that banana. And what you're going to find is that you're already operating in a high fat environment. If you're in that situation, then good luck. Metabolizing carbohydrate rich food is not going to be possible. Okay. So see if you can do as good a job as you've been doing with all these complex subjects at answering this question, which I know is very foundational to what you guys do with your clients and what you're, what you're helping people understand, which I think really this whole, the whole world of diabetes needs to be just turned upside down because it's just astonishing how much evidence like you, you're talking about is out there. And yet we're doing the exact wrong thing decade after decade, year after year, patient after patient. So here's the, here's the core question. Why does a low carb diet increase the risk for long-term complications of diabetes the the reason that this i mean there's there's so many reasons why this happens uh it it's uh it's kind of mind-boggling the number one most important reason is because it's very high in saturated fat okay as we talked about earlier saturated fat is okay when saturated fat is um present in your food in um significant quantities that saturated fat can basically um, over accumulate inside of your muscles and liver. So it's, if it were just to go to your adipose tissue or your fat tissue and stay there, then everything would be fine. And diabetes may not even exist as a, as a medical condition. The problem is that when you consume fat rich foods, the saturated fat gets directed to your adipose tissue for sure. And it goes and it lives there for a long period of time, but it also ends up in your muscle and it also ends up in your liver. And over the course of time, as your muscle and liver and uh, accumulate uh, more saturated fat for breakfast and for lunch and for dinner, for breakfast and lunch and dinner and today and tomorrow and next week and so on and so forth, then the lipid droplet that's present in each one of these cells begins to grow and grow and grow. And it gets to a point where the lipid droplet is uh, has become too large. And in that setting, then it starts to disrupt insulin signaling. And so effectively what those cells are responding to is they're saying, hey, wait a minute, if we could block more saturated fat from coming into these tissues, we would, we absolutely would do it, but they don't have a good self-defense mechanism against saturated fatty acids. So as a result of that, they say, okay, we do have a good saturated, or we do have a good self-defense mechanism against insulin. And if we initiate this thing called insulin resistance, and we make ourselves resistant to insulin, then the next time that you eat a banana, or the next time that you eat anything that's carbohydrate rich and the glucose from that food comes to the door and insulin knocks and says, hey, I have this glucose, do you wanna take it up? The cell can respond by saying, uh, 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 no, 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 I don't want that insulin, I don't want that glucose because I'm trying to block more energy from coming in. And insulin is such a powerful signal for allowing more energy to come into a cell that by blocking insulin, these cells can basically block energy from coming inside the cell. So that's exactly what they do. So what that means is that if you've already eaten a significant amount of saturated fat, cells create insulin resistance. Then the next time you eat something that's carbohydrate rich, the glucose from those carbohydrate chains ends up getting trapped inside of your blood. And the insulin who's saying, knock, knock, I got glucose, would you like to take it up? That also becomes trapped in your blood. And as a result of that, you end up with high insulin and high glucose levels, which is classic prediabetes. And so in that situation, you've actually eaten yourself into insulin resistance to begin with. And by eating yourself into in insulin resistance, there's now a traffic jam of glucose and a traffic jam of insulin that then leads to high glucose and high insulin levels, otherwise known as hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia. And in that situation, the doctor usually looks at it and goes, oh, looks like sugar's the problem. You've been eating too much sugar. You've been eating too many carbohydrates. Let's get rid of that. And that's the problem. But in reality, the problem was never sugar or carbohydrate to begin with. The problem was the saturated fat that caused the traffic jam. And if you simply go and reduce your saturated fat intake and you eat a significant amount of plant foods, then the saturated fatty acid content of these cells goes down and down and down and down and down. And by doing so, these cells then become more responsive to insulin because they stop this insulin resistance self-defense mechanism and they enable insulin to say, knock, knock, I got this glucose, do you wanna take it up? And the cells respond by saying, sure, let's take it up, okay? So insulin resistance is literally just an effect that's caused by either the excess accumulation of fatty acids, of saturated fatty acids, or 
in, the, in a setting where there's very little fatty acids, then the cells basically say, you know what, I'm going to put this insulin resistance thing away. Give me glucose because I can use that as a fuel. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it was one answer to my question. And you said that there were so many and I'm that's why you wrote the book. And everybody who is sitting on the verge of diabetes have been told they're pre-diabetic. If you have diabetic parents and siblings, um, if you've been treated with, you know, mainstream nutrition approaches, which, you know, these guys have been trying to explain to us why they're so off base. It's because it's complicated. I mean, because it's complicated because it's really easy to get cause and effect mixed up. But I want to just circle back and say, so what my question was is why does a low carb diet increase the risk for long-term complications of diabetes? And what Cyrus did is he took one answer to that, his the first one that, that if, if all we said was this one thing, here's what it is. And he said, because a low carb diet is also a diet high in saturated fats almost across the board. And then there's this cascading sequence of events that he explained in detail. So I just I just want to point that out that that yes. it's not we weren't even talking about the carbs. We were talking about the low carb diet is almost de facto also a high saturated fat diet. And people should care about that. I mean, all these these uh, people being put on these uh, diabetic diets, I'm like, but what about the effect on your longevity of eating like that? Yeah. And I mean, I didn't even go into detail about what's happening in other tissues, but in 20 seconds, I'll say that when you increase your intake of saturated fatty acids, you also dramatically increase uh, LDL cholesterol. And there's this thing called the Hegstead equation, which was developed back in the 80s and 90s um, that actually can predict. It can literally mathematically predict an increase in LDL cholesterol, which is your bad cholesterol, based off of the amount of saturated fat in your diet. And as you eat more saturated fat, your LDL cholesterol will go up. And that's exactly why you see in the research, when you look at people eating a ketogenic diet, they get a lot of improvements, but their LDL usually always goes up. And in addition to that, there's actually a whole nother body of research that shows that when you increase your saturated fat intake in your diet, that your risk for the development of cognitive decline, which is Alzheimer's disease and dementia, that also goes up. And there's two researchers named Dean and Aisha Sherzai in the world of plant-based diets. They have a whole bunch of content and a really fascinating information about how saturated fat can actually impair your brain's ability to function in the long term. Yeah, the connection between Alzheimer's or you know the brain in general and diabetes is just starting to get explored. I think we are right now with that subject where we were 20 years ago with the understanding of the gut and the microbiome. And so that's another five hour subject right there. But you guys have tackled this on. I really hope, I really hope for a day that everyone understands these things. And I hope that you guys are the Trojan horse or the Trojan horses that, that, you know, drive this, um, new body of knowledge. It's not even a new body of knowledge, but for some reason it gets too little attention into awareness because we have, we, we have such a meteoric rise in diabetes that some people have predicted that by 2050, all of us will be diabetic. And of course we all won't, but the point is that's the trend. That's how fast, um, diabetes is progressing in the population and it's, it's, it's destroying our ability to earn and support our families. And yeah, yeah. And, and you guys have it well under control eating more fruit than I've ever even heard of anybody eating. So, <laughs> but you, so you got your, say, say something really quick about Doug Graham, because Doug Graham, you know, I, I haven't read his books myself, but I know he's the 80, 10, 10 guy. So he really turned things up to, upside down when he said actually 80% carbohydrate, 10% fat, 10% protein is an appropriate diet. You guys still pretty much follow his principles and have found them to be life-changing and very true. Yeah. So we actually recommend that our patients or sorry, our, our clients eat a diet that's sort of closer to 70, 15, 15, or even 80, 10, 10, if they choose to do it that way. But somewhere in that ballpark, you know, of like, mainly carbohydrate with small amounts of fat and small amounts of protein. That's what gets you the best results. No questions asked. And, you know, individuals can vary it based off of how old they are, what their activity levels are. Um, and, you know, there's really like no set number, but the idea here is like high carbohydrate, low fat, low protein that gets tremendous results. Okay. Well, you guys are both brilliant and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, tell my listeners how they can plug into your content. You have a new book coming out. Tell them 
the name of it, where they can find it, and how they can be coached by you guys and follow you on social media. Thank you so much, Robin. Um, I'll tell everybody about everything we have. So we also have a podcast. Just type in Mastering Diabetes into any podcast platform and you'll find us. Um, we have a coaching program, like you mentioned. You can learn more about that on our website, masteringdiabetes.org. We do a wide range of options, whether somebody wants private coaching, small group coaching, our signature program with a larger group, or a DIY program. If you just want the information, do it yourself. We have that. The biggest thing here, our most exciting thing is the book. We have put a lot of effort over two years of writing this book, and we made sure it's very easy to understand, but also very scientific in the sense that everything is evidence-based. We're not making this stuff up. We have over 800 citations in this book, and again, easy to understand. So you're going to hear our story. We're going to have the science and then the how-to section. We're proud of all of it. There's over 30 recipes in this book. We have a meal plan. So you just do exactly what the meal plan says. Eat this for breakfast on week one. Then we have breakfast and lunch on week two, breakfast, lunch, and dinner on week three as you transition one step at a time, and we guarantee your results. So you use the book to figure out how insulin resistant you are. We have a quiz in there, and then you can choose which meal plan to use to make sure that as you transition, you also see stable blood glucose as you improve your overall insulin sensitivity. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it uh, from Barnes and Noble. You can buy it from the Kindle, Apple Books. We personally read the audiobook and we added in um, some extras at the beginning of each chapter. We made some annotations so with some additional information in many of the other chapters. So we're really excited about that. People get a chance to hear us. And we also have an option for free international shipping. So you can go to masteringdiabetes.org slash book. Then there'll be a link that takes you to book depository. And I don't know how they do it, but they give you a 10% discount off the cover price of the book and free worldwide shipping. So you can get it anywhere. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I'm, I'm excited for our folks who are um, struggling with diabetes or maybe they have someone they love who is, um, you should definitely get this book for them for their birthday for Christmas, but give it to them early because they need it right now. Um, and, uh, follow these guys work because they're really blazing a trail and calling attention to a massive body of evidence that has been highly neglected in treating diabetics. So you got anything you want to add to that? Uh, Cyrus, you gone? Cyrus had to, had to, uh, get to another appointment, but I just want to say thank you for your support. Um, you've been around for a long time. You've seen a lot of information and you're, um, your confidence in what we're doing means a lot. We're going to continue to work hard. We have a lot of lives to change. I mean, over 3,000 people have been through our coaching program, which is awesome. And we have amazing results and testimonials all over the place. But uh, the number of people struggling with diabetes is large. So we, we got to keep working hard here. And um, if anybody wants to connect with us on social media, we're all over the place, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, at Mastering Diabetes. You can connect with us there. But uh, we really hope everybody enjoys the book. And, you know, even for people who want to prevent diabetes, people who want to finally reach their ideal body weight, want to gain more energy, the program laid out in this book is your ticket. 